Now, um, I suppose that theoretically we could do the same trick as we did with the other organometallics and write this as ionic. Uh, I don't think people usually do that though because then we have to have two separate ions over here. Notice that organocuprates are a little complicated because there's always two carbon chains on the copper. There's always two carbon Why chains. Why is that? Just a matter of uh, valences and balancing the charges somewhat. So, so it just turns out that copper is not going to be neutral unless it's bonded to two separate things over here. We don't need to worry about that. We should just have that memorized. It, it will make two of the carbon chains. That's right. So we'll go through the reaction for that. But yeah, basically you just have to have memorized that this is what organocuprates look like. We're not going to try to explain why this is. Okay. So we're just going to have that uh, memorized. But I'm not going to talk about how to make this yet. Let's talk about how to use it, first of all. First of all, let's talk about how to use the organocuprates, and then we'll see how to use it. All right, so we're not going to write this as an ionic bond. Uh, I don't think that's conventional, because then we have a negative here, a negative here, and a positive two charge here. Then that's getting a little too wacky. Um, however, we should still uh, imagine these are going to be good nucleophiles. They're still good nucleophiles because they're pulling the electrons towards them. Even if we don't put full negative charges, they've got nice big partial negative charges uh, on them. So these should still be good nucleophilic carbons, just like the carbons are here. Basically, any time you attach a carbon to something that's to the left of it in the periodic table, it becomes negative, or at least partially negative, and turns into a good nucleophile. Just like when you attach a carbon to somebody who's to the right of it in the periodic table, it becomes at least partially positive, it becomes a good electrophile. Can something not being a carbon ever be an electrophile? Uh, yes, however, um, usually carbons are the electrophiles. So far, I don't think you've seen any non-carbon electrophiles. On this next midterm, I think... Uh, I do not think you've seen any reactions that use sulfur as an electrophile. You, you could prove me wrong, but I don't think so far that you've seen any reactions that use sulfur as an electrophile. After the midterm, you will see some reactions that use non-carbons, but I believe that at this point you've only seen carbon electrophiles, uh, which means you should be very cautious before you treat anything like an electrophile besides carbon on the midterm. Okay, uh, yeah. So um, we've seen lots of different types of nucleophiles, um, and now we're seeing how to make these copper nucleophiles. So let's see how this reaction would work here. Does everyone agree that these would be nucleophilic carbons? Yes. Okay, so how is it going to react with this guy over here? Well, the carbon here is going to attack this carbon, right? Because this carbon has the partial positive. This is the electrophilic carbon. So obviously, this guy will be at the head. Now, where is the carbon going to get the electrons from that it's using to form the new bond with this? They have to come from the bond because carbon doesn't have lone pairs. Right? Carbon doesn't have lone pairs. You know, I don't know if they even expected to draw the mechanism for this though. There's not much percentage for that. So let's just show how to draw the products. But that is kind of the basis of the mechanism right there. Let's just show how to draw the products. Uh, so it's, uh, it's always helpful to put in some numbers. So I put in some numbers. So I'll start over here with number one. Who's the number one attached to? Two. And who will the number two be attached to? Three. And who's the number three attached to? Four. All right, that's how you draw the product. Um, by the way, what happened to the iodide? Uh, we're not doing the whole mechanism, but you can see it's just going to be a normal SN2 leaving group over here. Ah, I can't resist. I get it. But this is supposed to be an SN2, so here's the mechanism. It's an SN2 What happened to the second? We don't care about that. They just, uh, the, just the metals just go floating away. Yeah, we're not going to bother with the metals. Okay. So All right, we have a lot of pieces to put together. So first, let's make sure we know how to do this. So uh, let's draw the product here. We won't worry too much about the mechanism. Let's just draw the product.
What what mechanism would we have here? What's the name of the mechanism? Remember, the whole point of this is to do an SN2 uh, type uh, reaction, even though we're not showing it. I'm going to go ahead and number these carbons. One, two, uh, then I'll call these three, four, and five. Uh, okay, so I'll start maybe, uh, maybe I'll start with these guys uh, over here. So three, four, five. Who's the five going to be attached to? One. One. Two, actually. Yeah, which one? Yeah, because who's the nucleophilic carbon? Two, because that's the one that's attached to the metal, right? Remember, the whole thing that's making a nucleophile is that it's attached to a metal that's giving it electrons. Maybe we should really have drawn this out. Maybe it would always be safer to draw it out like that. What I had on the board a second ago just means this, right? Just means two separate carbon chains out like this. Remember again that the carbon is more electronegative than the carbon, than the copper, so it's pulling the electron pair towards itself, so it has a partial minus that makes it into a good electrophile. All right, so I can't resist, I'll draw that mechanism. So there's that SN2 reaction. So who's the number five going to attach to? Yeah, here it doesn't make any difference because they're kind of equivalent, but on another problem we can make a big difference too. And who's the two attached to? One. One. All right, now I think one of you thought that both of these would attack the same molecule. It turns out that's not what happens here. One of these will attack one of these molecules, and the other one will attack a different molecule. So the fact that there happens to be these two identical chains here doesn't have any impact. The fact that these, they happen to have two of these identical changes does not affect the product at all. Um, it's not going to affect uh, the product here at all. So basically, for ter in terms of drawing the product, just focus on one of the carbon chains for an organic group rate. In terms of drawing the product, just use, uh, I, most of you guys got that right. So just focus on one of them, because they're going to be identical carbon chains anyway. All right, it's just a technicality that we need two of these to balance the charges on the copper and the lithium. That's not too important. Okay, and again, we've seen a way here to make uh, new carbon-carbon bonds. This is interesting because it makes something with no functional groups. We haven't seen many ways to get rid of functional groups, have we? So when would you use this on a synthesis? Well, if you see that the product has no functional groups, that's a very strong clue that this is the way to go. Um, yeah. If you see the product has no functional groups, there's an excellent chance that you want to do this reaction because the functional group got kicked off over here. Or if it's... Can you do it if you want, if it starts with a certain functional group and it ends with a different functional group? Because then, like, you can do, like, once you end up with this, you can then do, like, bromination? Possibly. That would be a little more complex than you would probably do on the test. And if you brominate it, you might not get the bromine in the right place. You could really only brominate over here because this is the most substituted, right? So in this course, this would probably be the end state when you wanted to make something that was uh, unfunctionalized. Okay. okay. Now, what would have happened here if I had used a Grignard? instead of an organocuprate? Nothing. Nothing. Good. Because remember, Grignards can't do SN2. And what would have happened if we had used an alkyl lithium? Nothing. 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 All right. So the whole purpose of thinking about this whole organocuprate is because it's the only one that can do this SN2. All right. Now, and still, in order to do the reactions you're giving us, we also have to know how to synthesize these. So now we know what to do with organocuprates. Now we have to see how to synthesize them. So let's erase this. So um, we're simply going over how to synthesize uh, organocuprates. Remember, these are called organocuprates. Uh, well, this is it. This is how you synthesize them. Okay. Um, so what, what, do we, what does your starting material have to be? An alkyl lithium. Yeah, it's got to be an alkyl lithium, or, a good, or I guess they call it an organolithium. Then you put in your copper iodide, and then you get this. One thing you should know is that through methods we won't talk about, even though we start with one of these carbon chains on the lithium, we end up with two identical chains on the copper. So this is just a minor technicality. It's not really going to affect how we use this. But we end up with two identical copper chains on the copper over here. Which of these is the nucleophilic carbon? That's the important thing. Down there. The one that's attached to the copper. So it's like Grignard reagents in that the copper goes between the lithium and the carbon. It's kind of an insertion reaction. Except yeah. the I goes away and we get two alkyls. Yep. Well put. That's right. Okay, so uh, this is simply a reaction you have to have uh, memorized. You might notice I don't have this memorized because I didn't make a flashcard and drill on it. The only way to learn a reaction is to make flashcards and really drill on things. So it's uh, 
it's one thing to look at something, but you can't really use this on a test unless you really work at it. Um, so it's important to have this. So now we know how to use alkyl uh, organocuprates and uh, how to make them.